Hello and welcome to a brand new series for this YouTube channel. It's called Run With. So this is a brand new series where I am meeting up with and chatting running with a whole array of runners from all over the country, from all different backgrounds and of all different abilities. There is already a great lineup of guests and I'm really excited to share them with you over the next few weeks. So today is episode one and my first guest for this series is someone that you may well know. He's featured in my vlogs, he's got a very good running vlog. It is Matt Rees, aka The Welsh Runner. For many of you, Matt is that guy. He's the face of London Marathon where in 2017 he stopped to help fellow runner David Wyeth cross the finish line. It was a moment that was captured on TV and it captured our hearts and the spirit of the marathon. We have got the coffees, the weather's a bit grim, um, but we're ready to ask some questions. So, how are you doing today? I'm good, ready for this interview. <laughs> a grilling. Okay, so let's start off with why did you start running? So, I started running to help with my mental health. Um, I had been going through some really bad patches of anxiety and depression. I had seen a number of counsellors, doctors, I'd been on medication and nothing was really working but everyone kept on saying just try running and then I finally did as a New Year's resolution in 2015 and I stuck with it and it really helped and it's massively changed my life. Amazing and did you find that it had an impact straight away? No. Um, I don't think it's like this magical cure where you go out for a run and then suddenly, oh wow, I'm mentally amazing, everything's great. Um, it was more slow, slow process, but I, I told myself I was going to stick with it. I started to enjoy the running and I saw massive benefits uh, to my mental health by doing it, so I kept with it. Great, and you were quite sporty before running. You played football, you were in the gym a lot. I think you described yourself as a self-confessed gym rat, is that right? Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. Um, so why wasn't the sports that you were doing beforehand, why wasn't that having the same impact on you mentally? Why wasn't that benefiting your mental health? I think all sports were helping with my mental health. Um, but I guess I wasn't doing, I was very sporty, but I wasn't doing enough sport. With running, I can pretty much go out and run every day. Whereas with football, I would train once a week, play a match once a week, and that'd be it really. Um, and there was nothing around that. I'd always been really sporty, but I didn't have this outlet like I do now with running for my mental health. But additional to that, with running, I can go out on my own and just clear my mind, some time to myself, and it's almost just resets myself. So I think with running, it has all these different aspects to it, why it helps so much with my mental health. I think all sport helps, but with running, I found something that I can do a lot of, and uh, I get some space just for my, myself. And I guess for a lot of people, uh, me included, when you're running, you can process your thoughts. Um, and if you don't really want to think, you can just whack on a podcast or, a good playlist and that takes you away from how you're feeling at the time too. There's lots of benefits to just getting out there and, and spending some time on the roads or the trails. Right, so your first marathon was pretty special because when did you start running? 2015? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, okay. And you did your first marathon the following year? Yeah. And that was London? Yep. Hell of a first marathon to be able to go and do. Yeah, I'm very lucky. Yeah, and your time in London was 2.29.55. Yeah, it was. <laughs> um, and that's after a year of running. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so that's pretty good, right? Oh yeah, it's amazing. Mm. Um, more than I ever dreamed of. When I first started running, I didn't know anything about times. 
Um, as I started to run, I realized that uh, a lot of male goals is that, that sub three barrier. Mm. Um, and then I didn't really know how good I could get, but I knew I wanted to give my first marathon everything. I wanted my debut to be special. So I remember the night before the marathon, actually the night before that, my dad was saying to me over dinner, so what are you going to go for? And I said, I'm going to go for a sub 230. And he's like, what on earth are you talking about? Why are you even saying that? Yeah, that's not a normal thing to say for your first Yeah, marathon. And I said, well, I feel like I'm in about 235 shape or something around there. So why not just go for it and just give it everything and see what I can do? I said, you can only debut once, and this is my chance. I'm in London, I'm going to give it everything. So he doubted me, but um, I had the last laugh. <laughs> okay, so it, it was impressive. What was your training like for your first marathon? So I learned a lot in my first year of running, an absolute incredible amount, more than I thought I would or could. Um, but my training wasn't optimum. My training, I think I averaged in the 10 weeks preceding the taper 70 miles, which is decent. Mm. Um, I'd now be looking to average a bit more, but back then it was 70 miles, but it wasn't a consistent 70 miles. It was 100 miles, 50 miles, 100 miles, 50 miles. I actually went on a stag weekend and had six days of rest the preceding, leading, up. leading up to the two weeks of the taper. So I had six days of rest, drinking and eating <sighs> greasy sausages and chips. <laughs> then going into a taper and then I didn't know what to do. I was like, well, I'm already tapered because I just had six days off. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't the best build up, but during that build up, I really did work hard. Um, it wasn't as consistent, uh, consistent as I would have liked, but I think maybe the, the deviation between 100 miles and 50 miles meant I didn't get injured. And I guess those extra six days that you spent eating greasy sausages um, just meant that your legs were a little bit fresher. Right? Yeah, I think I just had a massive taper in the end. Yeah. I went from, I think that week ended up being 16 miles um, to then going up again for the taper, which seems a random thing to do with 50 miles and then on the week, just pretty much just the marathon and a few jogs. So when you did your first marathon, obviously only been training for a year, did you realise at that point that you've got let's say, a bit of a talent for running? Um, I've always felt that I'm quite naturally fit. Mm. Um, I've played for a number of football teams and I always used to seem to end up with a nickname like The Engine or similar um, because I just don't stop running. Mm -hmm. I'm so competitive. Um, I wasn't always in the right place, but <laughs> I would always be running and closing the ball down. Um, so I knew I was fit. But running fitness is completely different to, you know, having a decent engine in midfield and football. And it wasn't long after starting running that I realised that I had some talent and I could, I could run quicker than most beginners. Uh, yeah, so there's definitely some talent there, but I think hard work is, is a massive factor too. Okay, so when it comes to hard work, do you believe that any normal runner so I'm a normal runner, I run normal times. Do you think that anybody that hasn't got talent, if they work hard enough, can achieve the same kind of times as somebody who has got natural talent? No. Someone who's naturally talented is always going to have a higher upper limit of their peak performance if everything goes right and all their training goes well. Yeah. But. I think hard work is a massive factor, especially in endurance sport and running. Hard work will get you a long way. I've seen some very untalented runners do some pretty special things. Mm. Um, I think I do have some talent and I haven't done anything special, but I've seen people do special things that probably have less talent than me. And that makes me a bit frustrated that I haven't worked as hard as maybe I could have or should have. Um, I have worked hard, but I know there's more to come. Okay, I have got a further question about that, which okay. I will ask you in a bit. Okay. Um, okay, now you've done a lot. Obviously, you joined Swansea Harriers when you first started running. How beneficial do you think that running clubs are in normal times, I guess, because at the moment it's a little bit up in the air with, with training runs and how clubs are working. But how beneficial do you think that running clubs are for a runner? Massive. So I started running in the January. I think I was in the club by the end of February, maybe beginning of March. Yeah. It didn't take me long to realize that I didn't know very much and I was doing all my runs on my own, which I loved, 
but it was good to join the club, get some company and learn. I was learning so much just from going down the club and training with others. Um, my competitive nature came out. I was talking running. I now had running friends. Um, you progress in your running, you make friends, it keeps it fun. Club nights were just, just brilliant and I absolutely love the, the running club scene. But I guess now um, we have social media and uh, the running community platform that's so big now. I guess social media can in a way replicate some of the club benefits online. Um, I think there's a great, great community on social media, running community, and I absolutely love it. Mm -hmm. And try and, um, what's the word? I try and engage with it the best I can and embrace it. But I don't think it replaces the club running scene. Okay. Uh, going out and meeting people, actual people, and running with them and learning from them, mm -hmm. and doing sessions that you may not have set yourself. And yeah, yeah. I think that's irreplaceable. Yeah. You, you can learn from social media, but you can also learn the wrong thing and copy people that are doing things badly or make friends with people but remotely and never see them. Mm -hmm. So I think getting out there and joining a club or just a, a social running group or whatever it might be, even just a group of runners that go out after work, I think is brilliant. You also, you obviously took to running like a duck to water um, and you can tell because you also went to Loughborough that year, which is your first year. So talk to me about what it was like at Loughborough. So yeah, I'd been running um, about seven or eight months when I went to Loughborough. Uh, went there to do an MRes, which was going to lead on to a PhD. And I can't lie and say that one of the reasons that I wanted to do this wasn't because of running, it was. They asked me in the interview, are you here just because you like running? I was like, no, no. <laughs> Energy in buildings is the reason I'm here. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to be in Loughborough. I knew this was an incredible sporting university yeah. with incredible coaches, incredible, incredible facilities. And I got there and it was an eye opener for sure. Went to my first track night and I was used to running on the track with maybe like six or seven people um, on a good turnout. Got there and it was 40 to 50 to 60. There's probably about a hundred people there that first, that first night I went. And he was, the coach was splitting us into groups and it was, it was insane. So there I am, um, 27, 28 and just all these very, very fast, hardworking, but also talented 18 year olds absolutely schooling me on the track. Um, yeah, it was a crazy experience. I loved it, but I'm not sure it was the best thing for me. I learned a lot again, and that was incredible, mm -hmm. but I was training for a marathon and there was all these 800 meter runners and 1500 meter runners uh, destroying me on the track and it wasn't, I don't know if it was the best approach to my marathon training. Okay, but you learned a thing or two. Oh yeah, I learned so much. Yeah. And that's what I've tried to do. From, from very early on in running, I've tried to learn as much as possible by speaking to as many people as possible and delving into the books and the podcasts and the courses and just everything. And I think that's really important. And is that what led you on to wanting to coach people? Absolutely. Um, coaching, it's almost like a dream come true for me. I'm, I now earn a living through doing something I absolutely love. I've always loved learning. Mm -hmm. And when I found running as my true passion, I decided to commit everything to learning as much as I can about the sport. And I've used a number of different approaches to do that. Um, but I think the biggest thing was actually taking that leap and starting to coach people. So initially I started coaching people for free just to try and learn a bit more. Uh, it's now my, my full-time job and I love it. I love helping people. I love seeing people progress and get their goals and I love learning along the way as well. Mm. And I know you're very involved with your clients that you, you get on board with their journeys, don't you? You, get, you like to talk to them. It's not just set them a weekly training plan. You, you like to know what's going on in their life. You like to know how they're feeling. Uh, feedback's really important to you. Massively. Yeah. The communication is so key. Um, it's, it's, that's the thing, you can get a training plan online for free and it will get you somewhere. But every runner is different and every runner needs a different thing at a different time. And I think all these nuances matter. Mm. Um, so that's what I try and do in my coaching. It's not just setting someone 
a threshold run or setting someone a VO2 max session. It's understanding what's going to make them a better runner, yeah. what's going to keep them happy, what's going to keep them motivated, and most of all, what's going to keep them consistent. Yeah, yeah that sounds about right. Matt coaches me too. Um, and I think sometimes that, that he can pull his hair out a little bit, actually, coaching me. It's, I am it's... going bald. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, not yet. Heavily receding, we'll say. <laughs> Okay, so we'll go back to London Marathon 2017, your moment in the limelight, and I don't think it was a wanted moment in the limelight. Um, talk me through what happened on that day. Um, <laughs> I'm guessing you're talking about what happened with me and David Wyeth. I am. Because my first response is, what happened? Why did I run so, not poorly, but poorly compared to what I wanted to run that day. So you were uh, having a bad race? I was having an awful race. Yeah. Um, I ran the Manchester Marathon a few weeks before mm. as a tempo run. Mm. It felt easy. I loved it. And I ran 2.33. Mm -hmm. And then I think that London day I ran 2.50 something. Reason was in that Manchester race, I pushed too hard. I didn't recover well after it because I was on top of the world hurt my calf and my calf was hurting during London. So you go around the corner, you see the finish line ahead of you. Yeah. But before you see that finish line, you see David Wyeth. Yeah. So I was having a bad race. Um, and as I get towards the mile, nearly finished, you always set new goals. So I knew I wasn't going to get a PB, but I was like, right, I'm going to dip under 250 here. Um, so I was pushing as hard as I could. And I saw David. Mm -hmm. I didn't know who David was, but I saw a man mm. and he was struggling really badly he was in a lot a lot of pain lots of stress um, and he collapsed I, it was I don't know if that was the first time he collapsed but I saw him collapse to the ground that must have been quite hard to see yeah yeah um, you see a lot of runners struggling but I hadn't seen anyone else collapse mm. and so close to the finish so it was just the obvious natural instinct to go over and see if he was okay um, he tried to like shoo me on and said no I'm fine I'm fine but it was very, very clear instantly that he wasn't fine. He wasn't really speaking properly. It was just all hand gestures telling me to go on. Mm. Um, so I helped him to his feet and said, I'm not leaving you here. You're going to make it to the finish and we'll just finish together. Amazing. Uh, you say it's the natural thing to do, but quite a few people had run past before you. So I do think it does take a special someone to stop and help somebody when they're in need and other people are passing them by. I think it is the natural thing to do is to stop when you see someone but many people that ran past you don't know what they saw or mm. after 26 miles of running you know your glycogen stores are gone there's no sugar going to your brain you're not thinking yeah. properly yeah I guess maybe my mind was in a better place because I hadn't exhausted my fitness I just hadn't been able to run because of muscle issues so you never know what people are thinking and I'm sure if it wasn't me, it would have been someone else that had stopped. But it was, um, it was a magical moment and it was captured on live TV. And I think the best thing about it is that you and David have remained good friends since that day, haven't yeah, you? So yeah. you made a friend. And... Oh, David's a great guy and I've made a friend and his family's great and we've met at events and we've run together since. Yeah. Um, he's beaten me, I've beaten him. We've got a little rivalry going. It's great. I absolutely love it. Brilliant. Um, but I do know, obviously, from talking to you about it before, um, that it did affect you a little bit being thrown into the limelight like that. Yeah, um, it wasn't what I was expecting. I go to run a marathon for me, my family. I don't go to run a marathon to end up on TV the next day. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a strange thing because obviously I helped David over the line, got back to my bag, and my phone was going crazy. And I didn't know I'd been caught on camera or been shown live on TV. Normally they're showing the race. They're not showing some guy helping another guy. Mm. Um, my phone was basically out of order. I couldn't look at it because it was just too many notifications coming through from all different social media, but also phone calls. And so I finally answered the phone and it was the BBC. And they asked me to go back to the finish line and I was, a bit bemused and then it all took off from there basically I did my first interview within 20 minutes of finishing the marathon and to be fair to the London Marathon they were great because I was getting all these different newspapers phoning me I don't know how they got my number it was it was difficult I was looking for my family to be reunited with them 
and the London Marathon took control of everything. They said, right, we'll do a press conference tomorrow. The media can come to us. Mm -hmm. And they sorted everything. They made sure David was okay. And yeah, it was, it, but it, it was difficult though. And it actually really helped having David there because I think if I'd been on my own in those interviews, I would have really struggled. But the fact he was there and we sort of bounced off each other, it was like we were both going through it together. And I think that's what made our friendship or has made our friendship yeah. so close now is that we went through a really surreal experience. Yeah. And it was great that it was this good news story and it was all over it the... It was an amazing news story. Yeah. And you did, and it I was think a positive bit of news. At that, that moment, I know that I've heard from lots of people that moment inspired lots of people um it inspired some people to start running it inspired more people to do more running it inspired people to want to sign up to marathons and i think there was a, a whole there's a whole range of people that were inspired by that for different reasons and it was a, a really heartwarming moment i can remember watching it getting a bit emotional well i think that's the great thing is that yes i was out of my comfort zone appearing on tv and doing interviews Yes, that wasn't really what I was going to run a marathon for, but it did inspire a lot of people. I've had so many people come up to me in real life on trains, just at expos, just on the street and saying how much it moved them or that they've started running now <clears throat> and they've started running now. And that's huge. Yeah. If, it, if it made one person start running or if it made one person see humanity in life or want to get out there and do something, then brilliant. Yeah, amazing. Okay, right. Shall we talk about your current goals? Let's do it. What are your current goals? Um, my absolute current short-term to medium-term goal is a 30-minute 10K. And I've got a YouTube channel with an all-in series. <laughs> Matt has got a YouTube channel, which I will put the link below to the playlist to his new all-in series. Yeah, so... Uh, a very obvious plug there. I'm doing an all-in series on YouTube, sharing my journey from the shape I'm in now mm -hmm. to that 30 minute 10K. Um, so the shape I'm in now is not the shape I want to be in. What shape are you in now? Well, I did a 5K time trial in 1630. Right. So I need to go twice as fast and faster. 1518. 1518. But that's soft because I've run time trials sub 15. Maybe they weren't accurate, but I've definitely been in better shape than that. Anyway, Soft 15 <laughs> <clears throat> um, yeah, so my, my goal is 30 minutes 10k, which is sub 31. Yep. And I've been in that shape, I know I have, I just haven't been in a race at the time. Yeah. But my bigger goal is a sub 220 marathon. And I'm a long way off, mm -hmm. but I know I've been in closer shape to that than my PB is. Yep. And I know. I have the hard work and the talent to run sub 220. I truly believe that I will do it. And I won't stop. I will not stop until I do it. I, I don't want it to come across arrogant or smug or whatever, but I will do it. I will run sub 220. I think that's half the battle though, isn't it? When you've got such a big goal is having that determination and the drive that you want to hit that goal and you will stop at nothing. Um, for you, what do you think will be how do you think you will hit that goal? Why haven't you hit it before? Why haven't I? Uh, good question. I've, and there's a number of reasons, and they're just going to come across as a bunch of excuses. Um, I can give you some of them, but, well, I will. Okay. <laughs> Let's hear your excuses. <laughs> Here we are. Okay, so excuses 101. So, I, you know, I ran 229 first marathon, great. I then went back to London the next year, and that was 2017. Um, that was the calf issue. And then ever since, I did Amsterdam, I got lazy, didn't train properly. The next year was the hot London where everyone ran poorly. And um, the only other, and then I got a stress fracture and I was in really good shape then. Um, then fast forward, the next real big attempt was Frankfurt, mm -hmm. uh, which was last year. And it was an absolute disaster. I was in good shape. I wasn't in sub 220 shape but I was in PB shape for sure. Uh, I did PB, but only by a few seconds. Uh, I got a stitch and I struggled and it didn't, wasn't my day, but that's the marathon. It, it doesn't owe you anything. You need to put the hard work in, turn up, try and execute your plan. And if it doesn't go right, you just need to do it all over again. Yeah. 
go again. Um, what is it about the marathon distance that keeps you, I mean, you've said that the marathon is your ultimate goal. What is it about the marathon distance for you? Why not focus, say, just on 5K, 10K times? There's an argument that I'm actually probably better at 5K, 10K. Um, I, you know, I do have some natural speed, um, which I haven't really uh, made the most of yet because the marathon is my big goal. And I just love it. I think the marathon is magical. I think you turn up in a marathon and it's such a long way and there's so much to think about. It's not just your fitness, it's your fueling. There's, most marathons are these mass events, thousands of people, it's exciting, there's drama. I, I just, it just grips me like no other distance. Mm -hmm. It's this, it's more than just a race it seems. And it just keeps me coming back and I want to, I want to nail one. I, don't, I want to nail a 5K and a 10K. But the fact that you can, you have to train for a marathon, take a shot at it, and you can't do one the next week, or the week after, or even the week after that. Not well, anyway. So you get a couple of shots a year, maybe three shots a year if you, if you work around it well. That excites me that it's such a big deal. It, it makes me want to get out and train for it. It really motivates me. You have to give a, a lot of yourself to the marathon. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about a typical marathon training week. What are your key sessions? What are your key runs in a typical week? For me? Yep. So yeah, I think marathon training has to differ depending who you are and what your strengths are. For me, I do big sessions and then a lot of recovery. So I might do two big sessions a week and then everything else is just easy around that to recover for the next big session. So it might be a Wednesday where I'll go out and do a marathon session. It might be between 15 and 20 miles. So it is pretty much a long run. Well, it is a long run. And then on the weekend, then it might be another long run. Um, again, it might be 20 miles or similar um, with some intensity. Before that, I'll build that foundation and base. You, you can't just go into 20 miles with intensity. You have to work your way to that standard. And then I'll drop in bits of speed in that training, um, but I'll make sure that I'm recovered for that speed. So I won't be doing a, a fast workout every week. I'll be doing more of these big sessions with um, threshold work in there and also marathon pace work in there. Okay, and um, for say for somebody like me who's marathon training, more of a typical standard, just you know. I think you were, <laughs> what were you trying to say? Okay, so put, put your teeth back in, lad. For your more average marathon runner, because obviously you're quite rapid, you're aiming to be elite one day, you know, you've got that, that talent and that hard work and, and that, those speeds in you, but for a more average marathon runner, what would you say would be the one key run in your marathon training week? The long run. The long run. Absolutely. That's your bread and butter. Yeah, yeah, it's not even debatable. Um, and should a normal average runner be adding intensity into their long run? I can't give you a straight answer there because it massively depends on it depends on your background and your training before that. Um, Coach head on though. Yeah. yeah. It depends the, on the, the key things, is so. consistency. If anything detracts from the consistency, then it's not worth doing. The consistency is the key. For the marathon, you need to be doing those long runs because the marathon is a long run. And that's going to um, bring around the physiological adaptations that you need and the strength and endurance that you need to run a marathon. Yep. If you can't do a long run, then you need to work up so you can because that's what the marathon is. Okay, um, and for if you've got, say somebody has got a 5K or even for you now with your 10K training, what will be your key session during that training? How does it differ from marathon training? So for 5K, 10K stuff, I do more sessions a week and they're faster sessions. Um, so with that marathon, I'm doing those two big sessions, whereas with a 10K, I might do a VO2 max type session, uh, anaerobic threshold type session and the long run. So it's it's more like two sessions and a long run, whereas the other one was a long run and a session. Okay. Um, but yeah, it'll be that it'll be a much faster running um, and much smaller volume sessions compared to the marathon, anyway. 
So do you think that the social media presence, the vlogging, the coaching, family life, do you think that that has detracted from your ability to hit your goals sooner? Yes, but I think it's easy to make excuses. Um, I love my life and the coaching, the vlogging, social media, it's all part of it. Yeah. Um, the coaching is my livelihood, that's how I make money and I love helping people. Uh, the social media, I absolutely love the running community on Instagram and not so much Twitter. Not so much Twitter. <laughs> uh, YouTube, the vlogging I love. I was a bit apprehensive when I first started vlogging, I was like, are people going to be like, who's this narcissistic fool sharing his life, it's not, it's not important. Mm. But the response I got was incredible mm. and so many people did seem to like it and left comments saying that they enjoyed it and I enjoy making it. Um, and these things are a part of who I am and I share as much as I can and I'm hoping that helps people. And does it detract from my running? Well, I think everyone with a busy lifestyle is going to struggle to work as hard as they could if they were a pro athlete. But am I going to use it as an excuse? No, because I really do have big goals and I think I can achieve them even with everything else going on. Um, do you think that um, by vlogging and by posting that that keeps you accountable? Um, not really. I think I'm accountable to, to myself and to you. Um, I love the support. I love people commenting and almost investing a little bit in my journey. Um, I get so many supportive comments, but then you all get the odd troll leaving something saying, oh, you're not working hard enough or, oh, you skipped a session. And it's funny how there's only a few of those comments, but they're the ones that stick. Yeah. But they don't see the bigger picture. They don't see my life. They see a little bit of it and I share as much as I can, but they don't see me getting up twice or three times in the night to feed Harry or all the other aspects of my life which are really important to me. Yeah. Running is, is huge, but my family is always going to come first. But I guess these internet trolls and people that do leave negative comments, they, I think they actually forget that you're a person, you're a real person with real feelings. Um, and I guess, it, like you said, it is hard because there's few negative comments. They, they're the ones that stick. So it's a meaningless comment from somebody, but it's stuck. Yeah. Running is a selfish sport. Mm. To, to do well in it, you've got to be quite selfish because you've got to do a lot of it. Mm. And I think I am selfish in some respects, but I also try and have a balanced life where my family comes first. I do want to do stuff with running. I do want to share on social media and I do want to make a living and help other people. Talking of helping other people, shall we lighten things up a little bit? <laughs> um, let's give some tips and some handy advice to anybody that's watching this. So aside from running, the actual running part, what other things can we all do that would benefit our running? Give me one thing that you would prioritise over, not over, but you would prioritise to benefit your running. So for me, one of the biggest things um, that people forget or neglect or think they can skimp on is sleep and it's so key it's the key to everything really you stress your body but you've got to recover and getting enough sleep is is imperative to that there's so many things that help you running um, nutrition's key you've got to be getting enough food and you've got to be fueling correctly for for the amount of work you're doing mm -hmm. strength to stay resilient and injury free um, stretching and massage and yoga and all the different conditioning to have a strong resilient body to be the best runner you can be but um, running is the key yeah and then recovering recovering through the sleep okay what about cross training what's your views on cross training cross training is great mm -hmm. um, I don't think anything can really replace running if you want to be a fast runner but you can get fit through cross training so it depends how it fits in your week what I would say is the key to everything is consistency and you need to do all the things that you can do to stay consistent. Anything that detracts from that consistency needs to be reconsidered. But anything that can help with it, which is all those things I've just listed, then do them because consistency is the key to everything. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and when it comes to strength and conditioning, what's your favourite type of strength workout? What really helps you? Uh, I like to lift heavy, um, 
for like five reps. I, I, do, I pretty much do five by five, mm -hmm. five sets of five heavy, heavy things like squats, um, just deadlifts, pull-ups. Mm -hmm. um, I do lots of uh, plyometric stuff. But for the strength work, yeah, just lift heavy and try and get as strong as I can. Because I think a lot of runners feel like they can't lift heavy, that they shouldn't be lifting heavy, but lifting heavy is good, right? Yeah, I, I came from, from the gym, so before I was running I was lifting heavy, mm. or heavy relative to what's heavy for me. Uh, there's some bodybuilders out there that are like, what is he on about heavy? <laughs> um, but yeah, so for me, I know how to build strength and I've just carried on with that um, compared to like lifting lots of reps yeah. um, because I get that through the running. Okay, amazing. Um, so are there any other coaching tips that you can pass on to anybody that's watching this at the moment? Um, take your easy runs easy. Mm -hmm. uh, but the main, the main one is listen to your body because if you listen to your body, it gives you signs. And if you listen to those signs, you can stay consistent. Okay, yeah, that sounds really good. Okay, so at the end of every interview, I am doing a would you rather question. And this week, you're the first week, <laughs> <laughs> but this week yours is, if you had one option, okay, so for the rest of your life, you can only run this, would you rather run uphill or run downhill? Ooh. That's really tricky. <laughs> um, I'm actually really good. That sounds really arrogant, but I'm actually, I see running downhill as one of my strengths. Yeah. I can really get the leg turnover and go quickly. And I do love running fast, but I think I'd have to go uphill. Ooh. Uphill because, let me, give, let me defend my answer. There's something, I don't know, there's something primal and animalistic about conquering mountains and conquering hills. You feel such a huge sense of satisfaction when you reach a summit, even if it's just a little hill in your local village. But running uphill is like, I don't know. You always want to be going up, don't you? I don't know, no. I, I'm waffling. No. So I would definitely go with running downhill because, well, it's just a lot easier. And for somebody like me, I actually go faster downhill. Oh, it's also harder to recover running downhill. Ah, uh, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, but then also, come on, your glutes going uphill. All that uphill. Yeah. The calves. Great glutes. The burn. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know in the comments whether you agree with Matt or if you agree with me. What would you rather do, run uphill or run downhill? I think that's it today. Um, I've really enjoyed asking you questions um, and finding out a bit more about you and your training and your goals. Um, well, thank you for having me on. <laughs> on your first first episode and I'm looking forward to following along all the other episodes. I really hope that you enjoyed hearing from Matt um, and got some useful tips um, and just enjoyed hearing a bit more about the man behind the Welsh runner. Next week I have two elite athletes who are participating in the London Marathon this year um, and they will be talking about their training and about what it's been like preparing for a strange London marathon where they'll be running, I think it's 19 and a half 2K laps. It will be the London Marathon Special Week, so please do subscribe and hit the notification bell so you do know when these videos are uploaded. But I hope you've enjoyed the start of this series, Run With. There'll be lots more exciting guests on the way. Stay safe and happy running.